think about climate change, when we think about sustainability, there's this immediate urge that a lot of people usually ask about, what can I do? And the role of individuals in taking meaningful action. And these are extremely important things. Each one of us has a role to play on an individual level, uh, at the micro level. But unfortunately, not enough of us have acted on an individual level over the last 30, 40 years. That now we're at a point where individual action is absolutely important, necessary, but not sufficient. Um, so I wanted to place this in the context of, of the democratic society that we, that we live in and, and that we interact with and that we aspire to improve and, uh, and make better uh, all the time. So, individual versus government, because this is how a lot of people think about it. Is the government going to tell us how to do things, or is this us individuals taking matters in our own, own hands? And I think that's, that's kind of the wrong, um, that the wrong dichotomy to think about this. So when we think in a democratic society... A government of the people, by the people, for the people. This is this is fundamental to what American democracy is. Uh, so we're not talking about a government dominating the people, telling the people what to do, and instructing people what to do. This is actually fundamentally, you know, in our hands, right? In a democratic process. So we have to own that democratic process. A lot of us are familiar with with this. You know, reduce, repair, recycle, and all the different iterations of this version. Um, extremely important to practice and implement it every step of our production, transportation, consumption system, in our schools, in our homes, and in our companies, in every uh, aspect of what we do. And again, had we done this in a very intense, comprehensive way in the last 30, 40 years since we've known about these issues, since silence, silent spring, we would be in a better position today, right? And we'll have quite a few more options and maybe 50 years to spare in terms of urgency. But unfortunately, we haven't done enough of this on a systematic way. So I want to add the, a broader base to the pyramid on top, which is rethink the overarching system within which we, we operate um, in a democratic process. We need everybody on board. And this is, this is not a political statement. This is not about being bipartisan or whatever, because it is a fact that every person in this country, on this planet, cares about clean water, cares about clean air, cares about clean soil. People care about decent quality of life. This is not a political choice. This is everybody uh, is in favor of these things. And there's usually the next step in that process is, yes, we care about these things, we want these things. The question is, how? Who's going to pay for it? Under what conditions? That's where people start splitting off in different directions. But the foundation, we're on the same page. So research and development is extremely important, and it's going to be even more important in the next uh, 10 years. The current technology that we have is good, but it's not good enough. When you're thinking of renewable energy, solar panels, wind turbines, all of these things, the current technology can take us far, but it will not end all of the problems that we're dealing with. I'll give you an example. When you think of solar panels, the, the latest, you know, most efficient solar panels that we have today, what are we going to do with them in 30 years when they become obsolete? All the toxic stuff that's in there. Do we have a plan? Do we have an infrastructure that will reduce and reuse and, and not dispose of all that toxic stuff? We don't. Um, so the current technology can take us far in terms of reducing the carbon footprint, in terms of producing more renewable energy, um, but it's not going to solve all of our problems, um, which means today we need to be investing massive amounts of resources and brain power into research and development, uh, material science research and development, so that we can... <laughs> ultimately tackle this challenge uh, completely. Um, and I think we, we can do it if we dedicate the resources to it. Um, ending planned obsolescence. All of these devices you have in your pockets, they're designed to expire essentially after three years or four years. I mean, even the new apps don't even you know, work on, on your old devices. We need to re-engineer 
rethink the way we engineer things for mass consumption uh, so that we don't um, we don't waste more resources by design. This is a system by design. Um, we need to transition into what we call a circular economy, where everything that we produce essentially comes in a little box that has uh, right now it comes with a, a little you know document that says user manual. This is how you use this thing. It needs to come with another document that says this is my living will. This is how you're going to use me for the next several years. And then when I die, this is how I'm going to re-enter the circular economy. And it's not just a piece of paper with the responsibility of an individual to take care of that piece of paper and actually do it. But we have to build the entire infrastructure for that circular economy so that it's not just your responsibility to drop it in a box somewhere, a recycling box, and then you don't know what happens to it. And that's going to create millions of jobs. It's going to create new industries. So that circular economy is truly circular in the sense that the design, the material science research that goes into the material that builds the device all the way to the end of life for that device and then how it re-enters the circular economy again. We're not even close to engineering that system, investing the resources to do that. So that's, that has to be part of the plan and that requires a lot of research and development and commitment to building the infrastructure for, for a circular economy. And then, if we commit the resources, I truly believe that the sky is the limit in terms of what can come out of this new circular economy. I'll give you an example in terms of these bold, transformative moments that we've had in our recent history. When, when JFK said, we're going to send a man to the moon in 10 years... Most people said, this is science fiction. The scientists said it's impossible. But also the scientists said, well, if you give us the resources and we put our brain power onto this thing, we could probably come up with something. And they were not thinking GPS. They were not thinking cell phones. They were not thinking of all of this technology that we have today that came out of the space program in indirect ways. They were literally thinking about sending a man to the moon. That was the goal. But then all the research and development that was put into it created this spillover effect of technological developments that we all benefit from today. So what was thought to be impossible, we dedicated the resources, the brain power to it, and we did it. During World War II, when FDR said, what does it take to win this war? And they told him, we need to be producing 100,000 airplanes, Oh, sorry, they told him 180,000. How many can we produce now? They told him 30,000 at the most. How many did we produce when we put the resources to it? Almost 300,000. Right? So this is kind of the, the American way of thinking that we need to revive, thinking big, thinking in transformative ways, and aiming with a vision towards something better. And then saying, what does it take now in terms of resources and brain power and priorities to make it happen? This is what I'm, what I'm proposing here. And if we have that, then really the sky is the limit in terms of what's, what's possible. Um, so I have, you know, good news and bad news. The bad news is, is that we're, the clock is ticking. The good news is that there is, we have a shot. We have a possibility. And that's what I want to uh, lay out today. And in this process, we need to rethink even the language we use and the language we want to avoid. And I would like to invite you to be radicals. Radical is not a, it's not a dirty word. It's not an insult. Let's take it linguistically. What radical means, it means going to the roots of the problem. We have deep structural problems, a climate crisis, an inequality crisis in this country and globally. And I'll illustrate this a socioeconomic exclusion crisis that also has an ecological, environmental dimension to it, and a dysfunctional political system, both in the U.S. and internationally, actually, uh, despite what some people may uh, call a reasonable political system. And the establishment, the political establishment in the U.S. and beyond, this is not a political statement about one party or the other, this is a consensus that we should be looking for in incremental bipartisan solutions. And to me, this is what 
reproduces the status quo when it comes to dealing with, with climate change. And we, we can't afford superficial change at this time. It's too late. And here I'm reminded of the words of Martin Luther King. In the context of the civil rights movement, but it's also important for us today in the context of dealing with climate change, where he essentially says, I have no time for the tranquilizing drug of gradualism and incrementalism. He was radical. He really wanted transformative change in the context of the civil rights. So the political establishment that we're dealing with is trying to convince us that incremental solutions are reasonable or affordable. That's, that's all we can do. And what I'm going to demonstrate today that this is the textbook definition of a status quo. And what I'm going to demonstrate today is that we actually have solutions that can help us design a better system, pay for a better system, without bankrupting the country, without turning the country into socialism or, or any of the usual things that you hear about. So this is actually within reach. This is the hope that we need to you know, introduce the younger generation to, that this is their fight uh, to, to win this planet. If temperatures, we're spiraling out of control, essentially, especially in the last couple of decades. Most scientists tell us that the two Celsius degree um, limit should be our limit, uh, and we're already spiraling so close to that, and, that, and that's by the end of the century. And you see the, the yellow lines there really accelerating in terms of getting closer to the 1.5 and the, and the 2 degrees. Uh, and because we haven't done anything transformative systemically to stop that or to slow it down. So anything incremental will keep that spiral going. This is the U.S., but I can show you pictures from other countries and globally who have rising levels of inequality and socioeconomic exclusion. Um, that's, that's also the area where climate change affects lower-income communities, communities of color, uh, more aggressively uh, in, in, this, in this sense. I want to emphasize this one picture about inequality to make the case that this is really dangerous destabilizing for the democratic process. Because we can't think of dealing with climate change without thinking of the democratic process. So I'm trying to link these pieces here. This is a, a bit complicated, but I'm going to simplify it for you. All right. Every time we go through a recession and then we recover from the recession, we want to look at who gained from the recovery. Was it the top 10%, the wealthiest 10%, or the bottom 90% of the population? So this is what, what it is. The blue bars, that's the bottom 90% of the population in the U.S. The red bars, the richest 10%. And it used to be the case in the you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, well, not so much the 70s, it used to be the case that most of the gains from a recovery after recession go to the bottom 90%, which is what you would expect. That's reasonable. But then over time, you start seeing the blue bars declining steadily, heavily, and then going negative. This is the recovery. This is not the recession. This picture here is the recovery from 2009 to 2012. And who gained from the recovery? The top 10% gained more than 100%. So the bottom 90% of the population lost, not just during the crisis, but during the recovery too. This is dangerous. And this is not a recent trend. This has been happening essentially since the 60s. Um, and we are not putting anything in place to sort of tame this effect or reverse it. So we're getting into really dangerous territory in terms of the democratic process and what it delivers to people in terms of quality of life. This picture here is uh, a job quality index. This is actually new. This was published um, in November with the team of economists that I'm involved with. And we'll publish this every month from now on. Uh, what the Job Quality Index is showing is that the quality of jobs since the 1990s has been steadily declining. So what is the Job Quality Index telling us? It's telling us, yes, we're creating a lot of jobs, especially right now. A lot of people say very low unemployment rate, the lowest since the 60s. But then when you talk to people one-on-one -on -one about are they, you know, are they getting ahead, they say, not really. It feels weird. The numbers are great, but... I'm not really experiencing that. Maybe it's just me. 
maybe somebody else is doing okay, everybody else is doing okay. Well, it turns out that's not the case. Most of the jobs that we create tend to be focused on lower paying jobs that pay nine to $10 an hour on average, and they tend to be concentrated in the lowest paying industries that offer on average 26 hours a week. This is the majority of jobs, not just a few. So we have something, something's fundamentally off with the way we're running the economy. And that's obviously feeding into that inequality picture where a lot of people working, working multiple jobs, but the pay is not there. The level of income required to sustain a decent living is not there. And that is dangerous economically, unsustainable economically, but also unsustainable in a democratic society. So we have all these features that are really working against the democratic system that we want to protect and enhance. If you're interested in this, uh, jobinequalityindex.com is where you can see all the information. This is global. In 2015, 80 people owned more than 50% of the wealth in the entire planet. 2016, it's 61, then it's 42, then it's 26, and very recent, and soon we'll get the numbers for 2019. I guarantee you it's going to be less than 26. And then what is it going to be in five years and 10 years? One person? And then beyond that. So this is not recent. This is a constant trend globally, nationally, and it's very unsustainable from a moral standpoint, environmental standpoint, economic standpoint, you name it. And it's not working in favor of enhancing democracy. Uh, zooming in on Franklin County, this data is from, uh, if you Google the MIT Living Wage Database or Living Wage Calculator, you can get this for any county in the United States. I just picked Franklin County. To this day, I didn't find a single county in the U.S. where the minimum wage is actually a living wage. So what, what the MIT uh, team does is they actually look at every county, they look at the cost of living. What does it take to, you know, for a family of two, family of three, to rent a house or an apartment, to buy food, transportation, health, all of these things. They actually look at the local cost in your county and they construct a way to identify what should be a living wage. And, and they give us this for you know families of different sizes with one parent working, two parents working, and so on. Uh, so this is where you will, you will find it. So I encourage you to look up your own county. And if please, if you find that your living wage uh, is meeting the minimum wage in, in your county, let me know because I haven't found a single one yet. Uh, and this is for larger families and so on. And then they break it down by cost of living. This is also for Franklin County. And it's no surprise. It's the things that people usually uh, talk about, feel in their pocketbook every month. It's health care. It's child care. It's transportation. It's uh, cost of heating and energy and so on. Um, so these are things that people feel and experience. But then the unemployment jobs numbers feel like, oh, the economy is doing great, so there must be something wrong with me maybe in particular, but the system as a whole is fine. And what I'm trying to argue here is that we have a systemic problem. It's not an individual problem. And this is for larger families too. So we have the three pieces of the puzzle on the table. People want to work. The planet is on fire. And that would involve a lot of work. And we have the technology to at least put a significant dent in this thing. We're not saying we can end it with existing technology. But we're told... We can't do it for some reason because the big question is, how are we going to pay for it? And it's because of the usual answers that we're accustomed to. You know, we're told the government doesn't have money. We're told the rich will never pay more taxes to pay for all of this. We're told that if we borrow from China, we'll go bankrupt and we'll turn the country into Venezuela. We'll have hyperinflation, all the usual things that you hear about spending too much money will break the economy, right? And what I would like to argue is we're going to call that bluff because there is a way and we've done it before and we actually do it all the time when we set the priorities straight. And what I'm arguing is that the priorities that we have right now are not the right priorities. Let me take you back to World War II. How did we pay for World War II? World War II came after the Great Depression. 
the most miserable time in U.S. history. There was no money to be taxed. There was no money to be borrowed. That was the Great Depression. And then we transitioned immediately into the most expensive government spending program in the history of the U.S., funding World War II. Where did the money come from? There was no money to be taxed. There was no money to be borrowed during the Great Depression and right at the beginning of the war. Where did the money come from? The money came from the federal government, the same way the federal government spends on anything. So did anybody during that decision to go into World War II say, we don't have the money, there's no taxes, tax revenues to pay for this thing, why don't we think about this massive global crisis, existential crisis, in a gradual, incremental way? How about we send 5,000 troops and see if we can scare them away? We'll send them 10,000 troops every week, see if we can scare them. Of course, that would be ridiculous. How do you win a massive war in a gradual, incremental way? That was not even on the table. The obvious solution was a massive intervention immediately. Where did the money come from? Well, the way the federal government spends is very different than the way the state of Ohio or the city of Columbus spends, or you and I spend at home. So whatever I'm going to describe next, please don't do this at home. This is only for the federal government, the sovereign issuer of the currency. So you have 535 lawmakers in Washington, D.C. They sit around, they make a decision, they vote, and the spending is automatically created via that vote. So the decision was, we're going to win this war, we're going to enter this war, and we're going to spend whatever it takes to win this thing. So the spending happened via what we call government spending money into existence. Some people like to call it printing money, but it's not always necessarily printing money. Definitely not today. We don't print money in the same way usually people think. So we're spending tons of money, hiring thousands and thousands of people all over the country to build for the war effort. And we're paying them decent wages. And it's a free country. They can do whatever they want with their income. So the spending already happened. The concern that the government had at the time and the concern that we should always have is what do people do with that spending, with that money? They're going to buy cars, they're going to buy houses, they're going to buy clothing, entertainment, whatever it is. It's a free country. It's their money. So what did we do during World War II? They started hiring workers, giving them decent income. But because of the massive scale of the war effort, we decided we're going to shut down the production of new cars in Detroit. We're going to shut down the production of new homes in the United States because we don't have the physical manpower and physical resources to do both the war effort and produce new cars. So had those individuals gone out on a shopping spree to buy new homes and new cars, what would have happened to home prices and car prices and everything else? Go through the roof. It would have caused inflation. So what did we do to convince all of the good patriots during World War II not to buy a car and not to buy a house? We convinced them, and we leveraged kind of the patriotic mood of the nation. We convinced them to buy government bonds. We call them freedom bonds and war bonds. So what is a government bond? It's a piece of paper that the federal government sells to the public. So I give you a piece of paper, you give me $10,000, and I say, I promise to pay you back in 10 years plus interest. So now you've given away the 10,000, you've given up your $10,000 worth of savings. The government now has it. So now you're not buying the new car. You're not buying the new house. You've abstained from consumption. You've postponed your consumption until after the war. And what happened during after, after the war? We had plenty of people to produce cars, plenty of people to produce homes. So when those bonds came due and people got their money back plus interest, they went back on a shopping spree, building new homes and buying new cars, which was the post-war boom. But the purpose, the initial purpose of you know, funding the war wasn't by taxing people or borrowing from people. The war was already funded via government spending. Those government bonds, war bonds, were sold during the war, not before the war. So they didn't fund the war. The purpose of selling government bonds, one of the purposes, was to tame the risk of inflation. 
and to keep us focused on the main challenge, which is winning the war and producing the physical resources to do it. Today, with the climate change crisis, we can do exactly the same. The federal government can set the priorities straight, spend on whatever we need to spend on, and then deal with the inflationary risk in the same way we've dealt with it in the past. And we have even more tools today to deal with the risk of inflation, which I'll explain. So when they say we can't pay for it, we can't afford it, call their bluff, because we know how to pay for it without causing inflation, without bankrupting the country, and without borrowing from China or from any other country. Right? So a, a little bit zooming in on, on this concept, because this is going to be important. And if people ask you, what is this thing called? It's called modern monetary theory. This is kind of the analytical framework that's behind the concept of the sovereignty of the federal government. It allows it to spend on all kinds of priorities without bankrupting the country, without causing inflation. And it focuses on the monetary sovereignty of the federal government. The state of Ohio doesn't have monetary sovereignty. We can't issue our own currency. So there's those of us here in this room, all over the country, are users of the currency, and the federal government is the issuer of the currency. So in order for us to be able to have dollars to spend and lend and borrow to each other, those dollars must come from an original source. The only legal source for money creation is the federal government. So by definition, the government has to spend it into existence first so that the rest of us can use it. So if the federal government decides, you know what, we want to be fiscally responsible, we want to balance our budget, we're going to spend $100 billion and tax $100 billion. So we're not putting any net new amount of money in the system. Then we'll be in trouble. So by design, in order for us to keep accumulating more savings and wealth over time, the federal government has to inject more than what it takes out, which means it has to run a deficit. And a deficit for the federal government is the exact equivalent to the penny of a surplus for the non-government sector, the rest of us. There's a question of distribution of who gets that surplus. That's a separate issue. But deficits for the federal government are the exact equivalent to surpluses for the rest of us. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. The state of Ohio can't do that because it's not an issue of the currency. You and I have to work hard, earn an income first, then spend it. And if we decide to spend beyond our income, we have to borrow from a friend or a bank, and then we have a financial burden. We have a debt that we must pay off. The only way to pay off your debt as an individual or as a city or as a state is to work harder, spend less, earn more, or both, to pay off your bills. The federal government doesn't operate in that space at all. It's the sovereign issue of the currency. Its responsibility, actually, is to spend more than what it takes out of the system so that the rest of us can accumulate wealth. The question is what to spend on and what are the priorities. These are at the center of the debate. It's not about how much tax revenues can the federal government generate in order to pay for clean technology and clean energy and better schools and better transportation. That's not the right question. The right question is, what are the priorities? Let's have the government spend on those priorities and then figure out the risk of inflation and, and beyond. At the state level, we can't think that way. We can't operate that way. This is the responsibility of the federal government. Not all countries have monetary sovereignty in the same way we talk about in the United States. So you have countries like Venezuela, countries like Greece. All of these countries have no to very little monetary sovereignty. Why? Because their debt is denominated in foreign currencies. They borrow and promise to pay back in dollars or euros or other foreign currencies. In the case of the U.S., a monetary sovereign government issues its own currency. Check. The U.S. creates the dollar. It taxes in the same currency. Check. All taxes on April 15th are to be paid in U.S. dollars. And then number three is very important. You only issue bonds denominated in the national currency. The entire U.S. national debt is denominated in U.S. dollars, not in any foreign currency. Whereas countries like Venezuela and Greece and most developing countries, they borrow and promise to pay back in a foreign currency. And that's where they lose monetary sovereignty. And most countries, developing countries, have what we call a fixed exchange rate. 
So they fix their currency to the dollar or to gold or to the euro. And when they do that, they lose monetary sovereignty. The U.S. doesn't do that. The U.S. has full monetary sovereignty, like Japan, like Canada, like the U.K. These are countries that enjoy full monetary sovereignty. So those countries with full monetary sovereignty are here. Countries with no monetary sovereignty, like Ecuador, doesn't even have its own currency. They use the U.S. dollar, completely dollarized. And then most developing countries are kind of in between, depending on how much external debt they have. So today I want to focus on countries that have full monetary sovereignty. And these are the countries that should take leadership immediately, should have, should have taken leadership years ago with massive commitment to dealing with climate change and investing in sustainability. So we have important distinction between issuer of the currency and the users of the currency. You and I can't do this at home. The state of Ohio can't do it. Yes, we have a role to play in terms of you know, reducing our use of uh, fossil fuels and conserving energy and, and being responsible as individuals. Cities have a role to play. You know, small, you know, low-hanging fruits. You know, switch all your light bulbs to LEDs and you'll save a lot of energy. You'll save a lot of fossil fuel consumption. Improve the transportation system. Improve, you know, weatherization of buildings. These are small, you know, low-hanging fruits that we all can do, cities and states and municipalities. But the big structural transformative things are not affordable for cities and states and local uh, um, um, you know, actors, so to speak, but it has to be transformative. So key implication of this monetary sovereignty, a government budget is not the same thing as a household budget. That's why I keep saying, don't try this at home. A government deficit equals the non-government sector surplus. So the government has the responsibility to run a deficit so that the rest of us accumulate wealth. Government spending is not constrained by tax revenues. We're used to thinking of taxpayers' money at the city level, at the state level, because we say it all the time. We pay taxes so we can fund the schools. We pay taxes so we can have the police and fire departments and infrastructure. It's true at the state and city level, not true at the federal government. Remember World War II? We didn't pay for it with taxes. There was no money to be taxed, right? So at the federal level, it's very different. But we're not saying that federal government spending is not constrained at all. We're saying it's not constrained by taxes. So what is the real constraint to government spending, federal government spending? The real constraint is the risk of inflation. And this is intuitive. Everybody knows if we print unlimited amounts of money, of course, we're going to have inflation. But let's dig deeper. What does, how does it actually work? If we pay millions of people to install solar panels and change the infrastructure and do all the right things, what are they going to do with their money? They're going to go out and buy stuff. It's a free country, right? They want to buy houses, they want to buy cars, they want to buy whatever. The question is, do we have enough productive capacity for millions of people to buy new cars? If the answer is yes, we have enough productive capacity, then the price of cars will not go up. But if we're going to have a shortage of cars, because millions of people want to buy new cars, then car prices are going to go up and it's going to cause inflation. Do we have a shortage of um, home construction resources? If the answer is yes, then that's going to cause inflation. But if we have plenty of productive capacity, there will be no risk of inflation from shortages. right? And in the U.S., we have plenty of productive capacity, both in the U.S. and globally. But this is not the only thing that causes inflation. There's a second, more important thing, which is market power. In some key areas of the economy, you have some key price setters who can set prices higher just because they can, and just because we let them. Because remember, the, lo the role of lawmakers is to regulate the system. And if we allow a health insurance company to price their services 20 30% more every year just because they can, then they will, right? So if we spend more just because we have plenty of productive capacity, doesn't mean that we're not going to have inflation. But inflation now is going to be driven by market power in key industries. And I can already tell you which industries in the U.S. today already are causing inflation. Not because of too much government spending or deficit. So if you look at inflation in the U.S., it's driven by four key areas. One is housing, 
Two is energy and transportation. Three, you guessed it, healthcare. And four is education. These are the drivers of inflation today. Before we even start spending on sustainability and you know massive climate change action. So if we start spending on climate action without tackling what's going on in those four areas, whether it's shortage of productive capacity, like in healthcare, we need more doctors and nurses and hospital beds. That's productive capacity, like the physical, technological capacity to serve more people. We need to build that up. The good news about productive capacity is that it's created. We can build more of it and create millions of jobs to do that. But market power for you know insulin, which is not something we discovered two years ago, we, we have... We know the chemical formula. It's pretty straightforward. We've known it for decades. It's cheap to produce and reproduce. Why do we charge hundreds of dollars per month for it? Because they can. Because they have enough market power. Because they're not regulated enough by the government to charge what they think they can get away with. So this is what we're talking about in terms of the role of government in terms of taxing and regulating the government is not going to be taxing in order to raise revenues to pay for health care. We're going to tax and regulate to reduce market power, which is a very different thing. So we're accustomed, we're almost systematically trained to think we're going to tax this to pay for that. That's how we always think about this. What I'm inviting you to do is to decouple the taxing from the spending. We already said the spending can happen when we make it a priority. When 535 lawmakers, or at least half of them, and D.C. decide we're going to spend on this. The taxing plays a completely different role at the federal level than at the local level. And I'm going to emphasize this. So you spend with an eye towards inflation, what, as I said, the four industries that we have, and we're going to do a paradigm shift in terms of how we think about taxing and spending. So this paradigm shift, decouple spending from taxing, spend on the priorities. Let's set the priorities straight. Then worry about the taxing. So spend in order to increase and improve productive capacity in strategic areas. Infrastructure, education, healthcare, and so on. Then tax pollution, tax speculation, tax excessive wealth. Not because we need the revenue. So we're going to tax fossil fuel industry not because we need their money or their permission to fund clean energy but because we want to decarbonize the economy. That's the point. We want to eliminate the fossil fuel industry, but not eliminate the livelihood of people who work in the fossil fuel industry. And that's why we have to think of the concept of just transition, transition with justice, with job guarantee, with decent wages and benefits. But we need to decarbonize. We, we can't afford not to. Tax speculation on Wall Street, not because we need their money or their permission to fund education, but because we want to reduce speculation which reduces financial instability, economic instability. That's the purpose of taxation in that case. It's not because we need the money. Tax extreme wealth, and here I really mean extreme wealth, and I showed you the numbers of inequality. We're not talking about upper middle class wealthy people. We're talking way beyond that. Extreme wealth, not because we need their money or their permission to fund green infrastructure or schools. Remember, we're decoupling spending from taxing. Why are we taxing excessive wealth? To reduce inequality, to reduce their power and influence in politics, to save democracy from oligarchy, to reduce their influence in the price system because they're involved in setting prices. That's the inflationary component too. So when you decouple taxing and spending at the federal level, you unleash a whole new vision that says, these are the priorities, we can pay for them. But now, how do we deal with inflation? How do we protect democracy? How do we protect the environment? You use the power of taxation and regulation for that purpose, not because we need somebody's money or somebody's permission to set the priorities straight. So tax to protect democracy, to reduce excessive wealth, abusive market power, regulate markets so that we pre-distribute wealth, not redistribute wealth. Because we usually think of it in this way. We have... The engine of the economy produces pollution, produces inequality, produces socioeconomic exclusion. And you say, oh, that's not a good result, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to tax people who have a lot of money and redistribute to people who lost in that process. 
what we're saying, we need to change the engine, the very engine of the economy, so that it redistributes wealth the right way from the beginning, so we don't have to redistribute, so that the new engine of the economy produces cleaner outcomes, produces more equitable outcomes, produces you know, prosperity for everyone, so we don't have to redistribute. Uh, and then the role of regulation is extremely important. Regulate markets to reduce excessive market power, price-setting behavior, and corruption. These are important goals that you know, we should decouple again the taxing and spending functions. Hashtag goals. So, in this context, the discussion about the Green New Deal and the Job Guarantee Framework, to me personally, and I'm involved obviously in thinking about these things and talking about these things, to me it's the most comprehensive way of dealing with all of these issues, climate change, inequality, socioeconomic exclusion, market power, inflation, all the cost of living issues that people deal with. And to me, if you were to summarize the philosophical framework of the Green New Deal, you take people as they are, where they are, and you do on-the-job paid training. So we're not going to tell people, you know, go learn how to code, move to San Francisco, and then, you know, pay for your own education out of pocket, and then maybe you'll compete and find a job. You don't do that to people you know, in the fossil fuel industry, you say, we're going to decarbonize, we're going to end your livelihood, and you're on your own. Go learn how to code. That's the future. We want to guarantee employment, so you take people as they are, where they are, and pay them decent wages and benefits to rebuild communities from, from within. And this is very important for us in Ohio and rural areas in particular uh, across the country. So we want to provide a broader support network that includes housing, mental health, legal aid, soft skills, family counseling, career counseling, so that we allow people to thrive on the job and reconnect with the local community on a stronger foundation. In other words, we don't give up on people. In other words, we lift everybody up to higher grounds. Because the idea of a job guarantee in and of itself is not sufficient. To tell somebody, we're going to guarantee you a job with decent wage and benefits. Now show up at 9 o'clock and be there, and if you mess up on the job, we're going to fire you, right? Because we've given you the best opportunity you have. But if I'm struggling with addiction, if I'm struggling with mental health issues, and you set me up with this job, I'm going to try to show up the first week, the second week, eventually I'm going to break. And then you're going to say, well, you had your chance. That's not fair, that's not right, especially knowing what's been happening in this country, especially in this part of the country, in the last 30 years with the opioid crisis, with the mental health crisis, that's why we need to have this comprehensive set of services to be part of the benefits package so that we're not setting people up for, for failure. So to me, a Green New Deal cannot be funded locally for reasons I explained. We don't have the monetary resources at the local level to pay for transformative things. It has to be federal. Local implementation is very important. We have to take ownership of this thing, just like we did with the New Deal of the 1930s which was introduced in every congressional district, we have to have more participatory democracy ownership of what kinds of jobs and what kinds of new resources we build. It has to be urban and rural. We're not going to tell people, move to the big cities. That's where the jobs are. That's where the solar farms are. It has to be inclusive, just, and restorative. Because the New Deal of the 30s was the New Deal of the 30s. It was implemented with all the cultural political system that we had at the time, which included segregation. So it was not exclusive, in inclusive. We should not repeat, obviously, the same mistakes. It needs to be inclusive, just in the, in the sense of just transition. For people who will be displaced from the fossil fuel industry, we need to guarantee jobs for them with decent wages and benefits. For people who will be displaced from the health insurance industry, once we transition to a more efficient system, there will be millions of people losing their jobs a just transition for them in other industries with the job guarantee, with decent wages and benefits, without telling them to move to San Francisco or move to other cities. Create jobs locally with decent wages and benefits. It needs to be comprehensive and permanent. By comprehensive, I mean we need to rethink everything we do. As I said earlier today, when I talked about the living will concept for everything we produce, that's what I mean, comprehensive, truly rethinking everything we do in the system to 
get into the circular economy concept that I talked about. It needs to be permanent. This is not something that we try for five years or ten years and say, we've dealt with climate change, now let's go back to normal. This has to be a new world of this circular economy. The good news is that these are very popular ideas for Republicans, for Democrats. This is the job guarantee. It's the most popular, and this is from a year ago. I think there's new polling that shows it's even more popular today. The idea of the Green New Deal is even more popular across the board for Republicans and Democrats because fundamentally people want clean air, clean jobs, good paying jobs, clean water, clean soil. These are things that everybody wants except the people who sort of hesitate or reject it are usually thinking, how are we going to pay for this? Are you going to tax me? So then my you know, income is on the line. Are you going to tax my employer, which means my job is on the line? This is where the fear comes in. And what we're saying here, no, 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 no. We're decoupling the spending from the taxing. We're not going to tax local districts and local states and municipalities to pay for this. We're going to do this the same way we did World War II, the same way we paid for the moonshot. But can we afford it? Yes, we can, I would argue. If you remember, somebody said, yes, we can many years ago, and then he said, no, we can't, because we don't have dollars. We run out of money. That was President Obama. Can we afford this? We need to change the narrative. We need to shift the conversation. Is this affordable? Is this affordable? And this is everywhere. Is this affordable? Can we afford this? This this is a friend of mine actually sent me pictures a month ago. This is her neighbor bathing her child in Pennsylvania and the water turned brown. And she immediately snapped the picture and of course took her child out of the thing. This is, to me, this is a crime scene. And yet there is no investigation. Right? Is this affordable? They spent thousands of dollars trying to fix their water system, put filters, you know, dug a new well, nothing worked. This is across the board. Can we afford this? These are the fires in California, the floods in the Midwest. I grew up in the Middle East. This is the Middle East in the summer. And scientists are very clear now. They're saying within our lifetime, this region will be uninhabitable during the summer months. So we're talking about 500 million climate refugees. So people who are panicking about Syrian refugees, just wait until this hits. And this is global. This is not just the Middle East. Can we afford this? Can we afford to wait for these disasters to keep accelerating? I don't think so. The good news is that Everything that I'm proposing in terms of these massive transformative things, they're actually pretty cheap compared to this. We just don't have the right metric. We're using the wrong metric. So most economists and policymakers, they talk about economic growth is the important thing. We need fracking because it brings jobs and creates income. So what is GDP, which is when they talk about economic growth, gross domestic product? GDP measures the total dollar amount of all goods and services produced annually. And it's been growing. You know, occasionally we hit a recession here and there. But it's essentially very clear we have economic growth because that's the goal we pursue. But remember, growth is not always a good thing. It's very funny. Economists are obsessed with growth. Policymakers are obsessed with growth. But if a friend told you I went to the doctor and after they did the test, they told me there was growth. What do we, how do you react? It's a disaster. It's a dangerous thing. And yet we have this thing about economic growth being okay. We're completely forgetting about the system that we live in, that we're part of a living, breathing system. And that growth, unlimited growth, is impossible, undesirable, unsustainable for human beings, for living things. And it's because we are measuring the wrong thing. So what is included in economic growth? We said every dollar we spend buying things and goods and services. So every time we have an oil spill and then we have to clean up the mess, we pay thousands of dollars to do that. That shows up as economic growth. That shows up as a positive thing. Every time we build a prison, it shows up as economic growth. 
And it gets celebrated on TV. They say, yay, economic growth, 3% more this quarter. But is that improving our quality of life? Every time we breathe polluted air, we drink polluted water, we go to a doctor for breathing treatment, we buy prescription drugs, we pay for cancer treatment, economic growth, that gets celebrated on TV because we're measuring this thing called growth. So what some ecological economists did, they said, okay, let's take this GDP thing and let's remove all of these negative things from it and see what's left. So when you remove the effects of pollution and prisons and all of that, you get a decent indication for quality of life. This is quality of life in the U.S. for the last 40 years. Stagnant. This is called the genuine progress indicator. And if we split this by income level, you can guess. Higher income groups have slightly better quality of life. And lower income groups, quality of life is declining. So what we're asking for here is we really need to shift the metric, shift the narrative, and focus on what matters. So if we get to a point where we invite all of our fellow citizens and policymakers and say, we want to focus on this thing called quality of life. How can we improve quality of life? All of a sudden, the list of investment changes. We say, well, to improve quality of life, maybe we shouldn't be doing fracking Maybe we should be thinking of different things that improve quality of life, access to education, health care, you know, parks, clean air, clean water. And all of a sudden, millions of new jobs and industries will be created to feed this process of improving quality of life. And this is really what I'm asking you to do. And I, I mentioned this earlier, so I'll just list it here. The four things that currently cause inflation, we need to tackle them head on in terms of market power, in terms of shortages, and that's why the Green New Deal includes something like Medicare for All, includes free education, includes housing guarantee and rent control, includes decarbonization. This is not just a shopping list of the economists who favor these things. These are designed specifically to tackle the current inflation pressure points in the economy. So my worst nightmare is for the idea of the Green New Deal to be embraced by everybody in Washington, D.C., and they start spending left and right in the name of the Green New Deal, and then we're going to have inflation, inevitably, from these areas. And then they say, aha, we told you so. This Green New Deal thing is going to cause inflation. It's going to bankrupt the country. We should stop this Green New Deal. So that's why I insist the Green New Deal must include these features. Otherwise, it will break the system. So... The job guarantee is a core feature of this in order to guarantee a just transition for people in the healthcare industry, for people in the fossil fuel industry and beyond. We're going to transform the system if we're really thinking of redesigning the system. So how do we do this? We set the priorities straight. First, universal public services in terms of green infrastructure, Medicare for all, health, housing for all, education for all, ch child care for all, as basic foundational pieces of our society. Next, a job guarantee for people who want to work. We have millions of people who want to work, decent wages and decent benefits. And then, as a third step, a generous income support for people who can't work or shouldn't work for health reasons or, or other reasons. This is the hierarchy of priorities as far as I'm concerned. And that's why I... I spent most of my career working on this concept of a job guarantee. It's a basic feature of this transition. So during the financial crisis, I played around with the number and said, what does it actually cost to have an actual job guarantee? Pe pay people decent wages and benefits. So I ran the number and said, what if we pay skilled people $20 an hour, $21, $18 an hour for semi-skilled people, and $15 an hour for people with basic skills? Let's see what a generous job guarantee program will cost. Is it really going to bankrupt the country? And assuming we have 23 million people, which was including people who are excluded from the official statistics, just to inflate the number, let's see if it's really going to be expensive. 40 hours a week with annual benefits, annual cost of running the program, it turns out to be less than 4% of GDP. And we spent trillions and trillions of dollars during the financial crisis, and we didn't even put a dent 
in unemployment or inequality, let alone addressing climate change. So the cost of an actual job guarantee program with generous benefits is actually cheap from a strictly financial perspective. What is not affordable are all the pictures that I showed you. What is not affordable are, is the status quo. Because today, these are the decisions that we're making. We're saying, should we fund an after-school program for kids to inspire them with music and theater and science and summer camps and hire professional people to do this work on a regular basis? And then we usually say, oh, that's too expensive. We can't afford that. We're going to have to charge more taxes and levies. So we don't do that. And instead, 20 years later, we build a prison for those same kids. Is that the right choice? Do we clean the water source or do we not do that and then end up paying for cancer treatment for everybody in town for the next 30 years? This is the way we need to change the conversation about what is affordable. So we're talking about all of this sustainability stuff is impossible, too expensive. They want to turn it around and say not doing that is already too expensive. So to conclude, we have 10 years to go to act on a massive scale, transformative scale. The climate crisis, the inequality crisis, the socioeconomic exclusion crisis, all of these things call for urgent and bold action, not small and incremental action. The current uh, climate and jobs policies are too weak, too slow, too expensive, and they don't even work. If they work, we'll say at least we're making progress. But as I've shown with the data, we're actually moving in the wrong direction. So economic justice and climate justice via living wage Green New Deal are possible, desirable, and affordable. Yes, again, we need individual commitment to these things. But if we want systemic change, then every individual needs to empower themselves with this knowledge that says a government for the people, by the people, of the people can transform the system from a systemic way. So... Each one of us, on our little scale, we can do positive things, but the most transformative thing we can do as individuals is to embrace a vision that's truly transformative. And I hope I was able to convey this, that this is not a pie in the sky. This is within reach. We've done this before. We can do it again. Thank you.